And I would like to turn our attention to our uh, next speaker by the name of Dr. Uh, Anne Baring, who received uh, her MA from Oxford University, her PhD in Wisdom Studies from Ubiquiti University in 2018. She's a Jungian analyst, author, and co-author of seven books, including with Jules Cashford, The Myth of the Goddess, Evolution of an Image with Andrew Harvey, The Mystic Vision and the Divine Feminine with Dr. Sila L. Worthy, Soul Power, an Agenda for a Conscious Humanity. Her most recent book, The Dream of the Cosmos, A Quest for the Soul, was published in 2013 and updated and reprinted in 2020, was awarded the Scientific and Medical Network Book Prize for 2013. The ground of all her work is a deep interest in the spiritual, mythological, shamanic, and artistic traditions of different cultures. And over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. So my paper will suggest that visionary experience is a neglected, even a forgotten aspect of sentience or consciousness, and that a culture is incomplete and impoverished if it fails to take account of visionary experience in the ancient interpretation of its meaning, that of receiving revelation, inspiration, and guidance from a transcendent dimension of consciousness that used to be called spirit. In focusing so much on the rational mind, we have lost touch with the heart and the soul. The heart is the conduit to the right hemisphere of the brain, the visionary imagination, and the soul. So why has visionary experience vanished? The definition of a visionary prior to 1650 was one who was able and accustomed to see visions. In 1750, when the belief that the physical universe was the only real one was becoming established in philosophical and scientific circles, the definition changed to someone who sees something which is not real. Today, a visionary may be defined, defined as someone who suffers from delusions or even hallucinations. So why the change in perception? To answer this question, I need to give an overview of visionary experience in earlier times. We do not know what the visionary experiences of the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers were like, nor those of the Neolithic shamans who built the great stone circles that still stand today. But we do know that a very long time ago, the whole of nature was infused with divine presence. Mountains, trees, rivers, springs, each had their own spirit or guardian, and these could communicate with humans. There was a different kind of consciousness to the one we have today, one that might be called participatory, rather than one where the observer is separated from what he is observing. At a later date, in dreams and waking visions, people walked and talked with gods and goddesses, and with angels and demons who were seen as emissaries of divine spirit. The Iliad and the Odyssey are full of these encounters. In the Apocrypha, the second book of Esdras, chapter four, and the book of Tobit, describe wonderful encounters with the archangels Uriel and Tobias and Raphael. The book of Revelation is replete with visions. Later, there was the Jewish visionary tradition of Kabbalah, known as the voice of the dove, and passed from master to pupil through many centuries. There were also the Gnostics who followed an inner revelatory path of ascension to higher realms that was originally practiced in the first temple in Jerusalem and long before that in the temples of Egypt. In Greece and Anatolia, there was a long tradition of enlightened men, among them the pre-Socratic philosophers Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and Parmenides, who were initiated through rites of incubation in caves and who brought back revelation and instruction from what they called the immortal realm. The visionary imagination was nourished and cultivated in those cultures where visionaries were, visionaries were regarded with respect as messengers of this realm. India had a visionary tradition descending from Vedic times where the writers of the Upanishads as well as the Buddha experience cosmic consciousness or divine consciousness. Persia had great Sufi mystics such as Rumi, Attar, Surawadi, Ibn Arabi, who drew people into the visionary experience of the Mundus Imaginalis. And in China, the Taoists entered into deep communion with the natural world, inspiring the sublime paintings of the Song Dynasty 
and the poetry of Wang Wei. Moving forward into Roman times, I invite you to listen to Apuleius's famous vision of the goddess Isis, described in his book, The Golden Ass, because it is one of the most extraordinary visionary descriptions that have come down to us from the past. Apuleius lived during the second century CE in the Roman province of Numidia in North Africa. He was a platonic philosopher who was also an initiate of the mysteries of Isis. And this is his vision. The apparition of a woman began to rise from the middle of the sea with so lovely a face that the gods themselves would have fallen down in adoration of it. First the head, then the whole shining body gradually emerged and stood before me, poised on the surface of the waves. Her long, thick hair fell in tapering ringlets on her lovely neck and was crowned with an intricate chaplet in which was woven every kind of flower. Just above her brows shone a round disc like a mirror or like the bright face of the moon, which told me who she was. Vipers rising from the left hand and right hand partings of her hair supported this disc with ears of corn bristling beside them. Her many colored robe was of the finest linen, part was glistening white, part crocus yellow and part glowing red. And along the entire hem, a woven border of flowers and fruit clung swaying in the breeze. But what caught and held my eye more than anything else was the deep black luster of her mantle. She wore it slung across her body from the right hip to the left shoulder, where it was caught in a knot resembling the boss of a shield. But part of it held, hung in innumerable folds, the tasseled fringe quivering. It was embroidered with glittering stars on the band and everywhere else. And in the mir middle gleamed a full and fiery moon. On her divine feet were slippers of palm leaves, the emblem of victory. And these are the unforgettable words that she spoke to him, imagining, imagine if one of us heard these words. I am nature, the universal mother, mistress of all the elements, primordial child of time, sovereign of all things spiritual, queen of the dead, queen also of the immortals, the single manifestation of all gods and goddesses that are. My nod governs the starry heights of heaven, the wholesome sea breezes and the dreadful silence of the world below. Though I am worshiped in many aspects and known by countless names and propitiated in all manner of different rites, yet the whole round earth venerates me. Then in the sixth century CE, there was the famous work of the philosopher Boethius, the consolation of philosophy, a book that was treasured by Charlemagne. He took it everywhere with him. Boethius had been taken prisoner by a barbarian emperor called Theodoric and was waiting in a cell in Pavia for his execution, mourning that his life was coming to an end. And this is what he wrote. While I was quietly thinking these thoughts over to myself and giving vent to my sorrow with the help of my pen, I became aware of a woman standing over me. She was of an awe-inspiring appearance, her eyes burning and keen beyond the usual power of men. It was difficult to be sure of her height, at times she was of average human size, while at others she seemed to touch the sky with the top of her head. And when she lifted herself even higher, she pierced it and was lost to human sight. Her clothes were made of perishable material of the finest thread, woven with the most delicate skill. Later, she told me that she had made them with her own hands. Their color was obscured, however, by a kind of film as if with long neglect, like statues covered in dust. Her hand, her dress had been torn by the hands of marauders who had each carried off such pieces as they could get. And there were some books in her right hand and in her left hand, she held a scepter. Tears had far, partly blinded me and I could not make out who this woman of such imperious authority was. I could only fix my eyes on the ground, overcome with surprise, and wait in silence for what she would do next. She came closer and sat down on the edge of my bed, and I felt her eyes resting on my face, which was downcast and lined with grief. 
This impressive woman, whom we can recognize as Sophia or divine wisdom, began to speak to him at great length, clarifying things that were perplexing him, going deep into philosophy and explaining to him why evil exists. In all, his pen wrote five books about what she said to him, which were somehow miraculously rescued from that cell in Pavia. Now in the 12th and 13th centuries in Europe, there was a sublime flowering of the visionary imagination in the building of the great cathedrals of Notre Dame and Chartres. What would European culture be without their exalted presence? The reconstruction of Notre Dame now in progress has revealed the incredible genius involved in creating these cathedrals. First of all, the vision of the architects, then the engineering and masonry skills of the builders, then the cutting, shaping, and transport, transporting of thousands of immature oak trees needed to construct the roof, the invention of flying buttresses, and astonishingly, the recent discovery while they were doing the re restoration that iron rivets had bound together the great blocks of masonry holding up the roof so that the walls supporting the roof would not buckle. Think of that for genius. The creation of these cathedrals was a stupendous collective endeavor. There are no words to convey their miraculous nature inspired initially by the vision of the architects. During the same 12th century, the visionary imagination was nourished by the feminine image of the Holy Grail and the wide dissemination through Europe of the Grail legends by the troubadours, who introduced the idea of a mystical quest and a new image of romantic love between men and women. In France, visions of the Black Madonna drew thousands of people in pilgrimage to holy places that had once been sacred to the goddess Isis. This was the time when Dante, with Beatrice as his spiritual guide, wrote his divine comedy after having the tremendous vision which he describes at the end of Paradiso. When St. Francis heard the voice of Christ speaking to him from a crucifix in a tiny hermitage in Assisi, telling him to rebuild his church. When Hildegard of Bingen experienced a great vision and wrote these words, in the year 1141 of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, when I was 42 and seven months old, a burning light coming from heaven poured into my mind. Like a flame which does not burn, but rather enkindles, it inflamed my heart and my breast, just as the sun warms something with its rays. The light said to me, you who receive these things for the manifestation of the things concealed, write what you see and hear. Then from the 15th century in Europe, we have 20 to 30,000 extraordinary texts written and painted by the alchemists whose revelations came from the cultivation of the visionary imagination, a faculty that Paracelsus called imaginatio vera. One of the most exquisite visionary manuscripts ever made now in the British Museum and called Splendor Solis, was created by an alchemist who lived in Augsburg. The work of these alchemists was looked upon as an opus divinum, a sacred work connecting the human soul with the divine ground. And then there is the Russian visionary Solovyov, who lived from 1853 to 1900 and had a vision of Sophia at the age of nine. At the age of 20, when he was in the British Library, he suddenly had another vision of her and a final one in Egypt when he went out into the night in distress looking for, looking for her and fell asleep and had a vision of her while he was lying there. And she revealed herself to him as the abundance of the Godhead, the eternal one, as he says, and that vision never left him. Later, he described his three visions of Sophia in a long poem and paid homage to her as his eternal friend the mistress of the earth, the woman of the apocalypse in chapter 12, and the queen of heaven, a trilogy of marvelous images of Sophia. Now it is over 120 years since Richard Morris Buck had the visionary experience which led him to write his extraordinary book, Cosmic Consciousness, which I recommend to all of you. 
After an evening talking with friends about the 18th century poets, he was being driven home in a handsome cab when he felt himself wrapped in a flame-colored cloud whose fire was coming, he realized, from within him. Directly afterwards, he says, there came upon me a sense of exultation, of immense joyousness, accompanied or immediately followed by an intellectual illumination impossible to describe. Among other, thing, among other things, I did not merely come to believe, but I saw that the universe is not composed of dead matter, but is on the contrary, a living presence. I became conscious in myself of eternal life. It was not a conviction that I would have eternal life, but a consciousness that I possessed eternal life then. I saw that all men are immortal, that the cosmic order is such that without any peradventure, all things work together for the good of each and all, that the foundation principle of the world, of all the worlds, is what we call love, and that the happiness of each and all is in the long run absolutely certain. Forty years ago, I had a visionary dream of a cosmic woman whose form reached from earth to heaven, what I saw, I now realize, was the Godhead itself showing itself to me in feminine form, as it did to Solovyov. This dream changed the course of my life. The visionary has to adapt the direct shamanic experience of a transcendent reality to the level of understanding of his time, and also struggle to integrate it with his own understanding. He or she is really a kind of translator. Jung was a visionary, but it took him many years to integrate the visions which began when he was 35, before he could embark on his life work as a healer of souls. And it's taken me 50 years to integrate the vision that I had. It is clear to me from my study of visionary experience in many cultures, that a visionary or shaman is aware of the reality of worlds and presences inaccessible to our normal state of consciousness. I am absolutely certain through my study of visionary experience described in the mystic vision, the book that I wrote with Andrew Harvey, that a wider, deeper consciousness than our own is trying to reach us, trying to make itself known to us. It has been doing so for millennia. As long as this dimension of consciousness is denied existence and dissociated from our own, it will act in the manner of an unconscious autonomous complex, influencing us without our awareness in all kinds of negative ways. As long as we believe that consciousness begins and ends with the physical brain, we will never reach what we are capable of becoming, people who are in conscious communion with metaphysical reality. Where today are the creations of the visionary imagination that has gifted us with so many incomparable riches? Riches expressed in architecture, painting, poetry, music, literature, and revelatory experience. The whole foundation of our lives is missing because we now have become a one-eyed culture which has lost the visionary eye, the eye of revelation. Fortunately, it is returning in many accounts of the near-death experience and in the growing interest in shamanic and psychedelic experience. This may be one door through which we may once again reconnect with other dimensions of reality. So to end, this weekend is the time of a lunar eclipse when we are asked to let go of old patterns and embark on a new story. The full moon of May is also the moon that is sacred to the Buddha and his teaching about nonviolence. As we contemplate the depths to which we can descend in the brutality and horror of Putin's violation of Ukraine, we can also contemplate the heights we are capable of attaining once we have aligned ourselves with a higher wisdom and a greater goal. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, and what, what a delicious sharing with us, uh, really, truly inspiring and filling of my soul, and I'm sure of many others who have been here privileged to be able to 
drink of your words and of your very being. Thank you so much for that.